actually pretty cool because I've actually gotten some pretty good feedback where um, didn't really pay attention to um, when working with my class for this every and everything that I'm doing there didn't realize that we don't cover every single chapter so it's kind of interesting that we get to be able to do something like this because um, it, it actually gives some of my students a little bit of feedback as well so um, I hope you enjoy this part of it because this is actually one of my uh, I want to say one of my favorite parts of um, the whole exercise fitness wellness athletics realm and that's as NASM calls it exercise meta, um, metabolism and then as bioenergetics and really this is the nuts and bolts that if you were to take a college course or, or you know anything along those lines this is actually the true exercise physiology component of, um, of that particular course so you have your anatomy your physiology and then you have your exercise physiology and it's basically taken and really understanding how you break down nutrients into energy and that's really what it comes down to and so basically it's it's food in and then that whole process to the breakdown with or without oxygen and then really what it comes down to is how it works within the cells so let's kind of roll through here and uh let's not skip a beat here so uh, again bioenergetic study of how energy is transformed through various biochemical reactions so again you know biochemistry is really critical for this but when looking into test taking and, and looking at everything itself from that perspective and your study habits and everything like that, just understand what it really is and then what comes from that, okay? So when you're looking through your book and then when you're looking through these slides and then listening to me, this is really what you want to understand is the nuts and bolts of it, okay? Now, if you're in school or you know, you're in high school or if you're in college or you're not in college, um, all this stuff kind of relates to that that human anatomy component and then the breakdown into that cellular component. So um, really, what are we talking about? Metabolism. Well, you know, that's a pretty common choice word. But basically, metabolism is how our body reacts to break things down to be able to use it within our system. All right. And our metabolism really is how we take energy and use it to maintain our functioning throughout the day. Resting metabolism, exercise metabolism, they all have their important components. So there's your exercise metabolism, and that's really the basic physiological needs that your body requires during specific, and let's make that very clear, specific types of exercise because resistance training, um, power-based plyometric training, you know, the explosive component, um, long duration, cardiorespiratory fitness duration, so cardio-based training, all those are going to have different reactions that are going to occur that are going to use different fuels or fuel substrates to then be able to function during that movement and then how you recover afterwards, okay? So let's break it down. Nutrient substrates. What are we talking about here? Now, this is where it gets a little tricky because as a personal trainer, as a fitness coach, as a wellness coach, whatever it is that you're looking to go into, the nutrition component of everything is very tricky. And, and I want you to make sure that you understand that this is not that. This isn't like you're going to be going to be a registered dietitian. We're basically talking about how you understand how carbs, fats, and proteins break down within the system to then be able to be used for energy to be able to basically sustain living and then to be able to run away from a bear. Well, I don't recommend it. Um, I'm down here in Florida, so basically how I run away from alligators. But really it's more about, you know, you know, run away from snakes, whatever you want to call it. But it's how you sustain your living through, you know, the fight or flight, you know, and that could also be with resistance training, running, everything like that. So it's really that. So Proteins, carbs, and fats, or carbs, fats, and proteins, whatever way you want to order them. If you think about it always, I always like to just say carbs, fats, proteins. Because if you start getting used to saying you know, to your people carbs, fats, proteins, carbs, fats, proteins, and you repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, what you basically are doing is just giving them the order of operation for what is it that's going to be the most useful. And I don't mean that in, you know, like it's... It, <clears throat> It's a tough one because it is the most useful because it's the most aggressive. It's the most um, abundant that we can have in, in most senses because typically 
carbohydrates are that first fuel source. That, that's what I mean. So it's the primary. Let me use the right word, primary. All right, so carbohydrates are going to be the main fuel source for the brain. They're going to be the main fuel. They're going to be the first go-to fuel source when we go to start exercising, um, because typically during resting times, that is you know rest and low intensity exercise. That's where fat starts to come into play. So we have these carbohydrates that want to be broken down for fuel, and that's going to help us sustain the exercise that we need to do. Moving from you know if we're doing cardio moving from that lower intensity and then revving up as we get into a longer run or a longer bike or row or anything like that. You, you know, you may start off in that little bit of a fat burn. Now, don't mistake that for the fat burning zone, but understand that carbohydrates are going to be the primary fuel source until really, if you, you know, in most exercise physiology textbooks, they really say that it's about after about two hours of sustained work, do you really start hitting that wall and really starting to uh, switch over and go into uh, fat burning primary because you've depleted all of your, as they labeled it here, storage form of carbohydrate, which is glycogen. Now, glycogen is broken into two components. You have liver and you have muscle, okay? So you have liver and muscle glycogen. Typically, that's the two storage areas and it's stored as glycogen. Now, glycogen needs to be used in some way, and that's what we're going to get into on the next page. Glycogen is stored, and it's stored in the, the liver and the muscle. And it's obviously float, and, and if it's floating through the bloodstream, it's no longer glycogen. That's glucose. Okay, so we want to make sure that we understand that that's the difference there. Glycogen is stored. Glucose is not. Okay, so moving to the next one, we talked about fats. Okay, but we'll talk about glucose in a second. But moving into fats, again, at rest, at low intensity work, all right, it's really important. And then after all glycogen has been depleted from the body, fat wants to be burned. Now, what is the fat source? The fat source is triglycerides. Now, we always stress about our triglyceride levels, you know, in, in, in general health. But for triglyceride purposes here, that's the storage form of fat that we're going to use and that's going to be broken down into what we would call a glycerol and three fatty acids. And that's truly what triglycerides are. It's a glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. Now, I say that simply because of the fact that this is how we make ATP. And we'll talk about ATP in a little bit. But this is how we make, you know, heat energy. This is how we make energy. A glycerol molecule, which can be burned kind of like a carbohydrate in some sense. And then fatty acids, which get you know, their own little entity where they're broken down as fats. Okay. So, you know, very important fats are, you know, again, <laughs> the, the premise is always, you know, well, we can't have that much fat. Well, you need to have some fat because this is the reason why, because we have to have foods that have some fat. doesn't mean we have to go on the deep end and we have to go, you know, into ketosis or, you know, and then we start looking at different diets, but it does mean that we do have to have fat in our system, you know, and they always say, to burn fat, you got to eat fat. And it's that's kind of true. You know, it's not something that's unheard of. So just understand carbohydrates first, fats are second. Fats are stored as triglycerides. Um, and those are, and like I broke it down a little bit further into a glycerol and three fatty acids. All right. And then the third fuel source is protein. Now, protein we know is always what we consider the building block of muscle. Um, they're amino acids. Okay. But in the terms of energy for exercise, energy for um, or just overall, just general work throughout the day in terms of rest or working or anything like that, protein's rarely going to be used. And really, if we wanted to break this down a little bit more, um, super long duration, if I can type today, super long duration exercises. So we're talking about like ultra marathons, things like that. And lastly starvation okay those are the two main times that protein is really the most active in terms of energy because it's the last ditch effort okay so you know when you're talking about iron man um iron man competitions you're talking about ultra marathons you're talking about um the some of the ruck races that people do that take you overnight into these 24-hour crazy types of environments it's very difficult to get to that point, but there are times where you will start to degrade protein 
because it's going proteins within muscle and other areas and you will break down protein to basically supply the body with energy that it needs now very difficult to get there and not only that when you break down proteins you stand the chance that you know anything from if you've ever heard of the term rhabdo or um, where the kidneys basically can't flush the excess protein that's in in the kidneys and you start getting this really nasty basically internal infection where your body becomes inflamed um, you start to have uh, severe reactions like um, dizziness, fainting. Um, you basically end up in the emergency room because your kidneys are in the process of shutting you down. All right. So that can be really, really scary. So proteins are very, very vital for energy for very tail ends of very long duration things. Or like we said, um, I hate to, you know, say it but like third world countries you see you know people are starving in those third world countries and they get into the starvation mode well, that's why you see them they have very little mu you know muscle mass because their bodies just need something to keep them fueled okay and so lastly if we kind of hit back i'm just going to go right back here we talked about glycogen and the two forms liver and muscle when we talk about gluconeogenesis what we're saying here is this is basically a way that we can take a fat and um, use that in its own way. Okay, so fats are kind of its own entity. Carbohydrates and basically, it's, it's kind of crazy, but you can basically create new glucose or new carbohydrates within the system through the use of things like they call here non-carb sources like amino acids. Um, basically, you can take proteins within the body they can go through transformations and you can go under the term gluconeogenesis and take and make new glucose molecules out of amino acids. So it's pretty cool. Um, very important to sustain um, functioning when you start getting into these longer duration types of environments, okay, or competition. So, but we always are under that gluconeogenesis effect because ultimately we have to make new glucose, all right? And it's really, really important that we do. Um, Gluconeogenesis can occur in the liver, and usually it can also occur because you're going to take glycogen and resynthesize it into glucose or remake it. Okay, so we've gotten all this stuff here: carbs, fats, you know, carbs, fats, and proteins. We've kind of talked a little bit about how they break down. All right, went into a little bit more detail, but what happens then? It's like, okay, well, I got a carbohydrate, I got energy, right? No, well, inside of that food stuff. What we're saying here is that you're going to basically have, you know, an abundance of what we would call ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And that is a molecule of stored energy that when it's broken down, as it says here, into ADP, it, ATP is broken down and it releases that stored energy to then be able to create work. Well, once, AT, once there's enough ATP, it can create work like attaching um, myosin to, um, so if we take myosin and connect it to the active heads, um, the, to the actin molecules, the active heads of the myosin to the actin molecules, myosin and actin, they're both basically the functional, me the mechanical components of um, the, the muscles, muscle fibers, the lowest myofibrils that we have. Um, and without ATP there, you're not going to have that connection and that ratchet effect that basically makes cross bridges work and we can't have muscle contraction. So we have to have ATP for everything that we do. So ATP is very important to have. Um, if you were to um, weigh it out within the system, really, and how and ATP is a very small molecule. Okay, but in the system, in our system, we have roughly 800 to 1,000 grams stored, uh, 1,000 grams stored within our system throughout the whole body. So not a really lot compared to the the average size of a person. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. That's not going to be something you're going to be asking in your test, but it's just something to kind of think about about how much ATP we really have versus how big our bodies really are. So you you know you're at any given time ATP needs to be used. I mean. ATP is used to make your bladder work. It's made to digest food. It's made to contract muscles. It's made to breathe. It's made so that when you have the exchange of oxygen at the lungs to the capillaries 
that are surrounding them to be able to then move oxygen to the rest of the body, well, then there you go. I mean, you, you need ATP for that reason. It's for all work within the system. And that's why when we say mechanical work, it's all the things that make it function, okay? Well, how does that really kind of work? Um, what happens here is, and I'll kind of map it out a little bit. So ATP is here, and that's basically, you know, an adenosine group. Kind of just, you know, um, make it here, and then three phosphates. And what happens is, the you basically under this this stored energy fact. When you have something that needs to be broken down and energy needs to be released, you then break off one phosphate. So now you have two, which is also now called ADP. Okay, and what ADP has to have happen to remake ATP to get this to go back to ATP over here, we need to be able to take that phosphate that is now floating around by itself and it has to be able to reform and go back to ADP. So what we end up having is a, a phosphate group finds a CR group or what we would call creatine and it will make what we call PCR. So now you have phosphocreatine, creatine phosphate, it, it, phosphocreatine, there's the same terminology, same thing. Sometimes you may see it as CRP, Sometimes you may see a PCR, or sometimes you may just see it as PC, but that's what was happening here. So now this, this phosphocreatine will then relink back up with the ADP, and it will create ATP. And it's that vicious cycle that always occurs. ATP breaks down into ADP, that, phos that phosphate group finds the creatine group and resynthesizes ADP back to ATP. So you are always got friends hanging out and doing their thing. And that's where we get into the ATP PC system. What we're saying here is that what I just explained to you about the breakdown of ATP and the use of PC, it happens very quickly. And what happens here is you end up with, if you were to go all out and ATP and PC were not, and PC was not able to resynthesize, you could basically keep the body uh, max effort up to about 10 seconds. That's how quickly ATP can just completely deteriorate from your system, or not deteriorate, that's a bad word. How the ATP can be broken down into the system, and it cannot, and if it's not resynthesized, it's basically going to just cause you to stop moving and doing what you're supposed to be doing. And basically, it, you'll die, because ATP needs to constantly be recycled to be able to be used. So, what we're saying here is that when you're working on the ATP PC system, it's very short duration, high intensity types of things. Um, a vertical jump is an ATP PC system type of movement. Um, a one repetition max is an ATP PC system movement. Okay. Um, and, and really it's most things that last about six to 10 seconds. What that means is that if you're doing all out work, it means that the ATP breakdown cannot be um, the ATP rebuild from ADP, which I was talking about in the last slide, what it can't do is it cannot basically keep up with the demand of more ATP, so you have to stop. And that's where you have to rest and fatigue needs to come into play. What happens, though, is you end up going into something called anaerobic glycolysis, or as they're talking about, glycolysis. Okay, from here... Now, this can be, this is always, this, there's a discrepancy here. Sometimes it's 30 to, 30 to 50, sometimes it's 30 to 60 seconds. It varies depending upon textbooks and other, other materials. But, you know, for our sake, for your sake, when you're talking about this on a test, go with the 30 to 50. But what we're saying here is that you can do moderate intensity, moderate duration work up to 30 to 50 seconds and... It means that you're now going to break down glucose to create ATP to then be able to be used. So the type of work that you're going to do here is not high intensity because we already talked about it up here. And this is where you get all that. This is going to be more moderate based types of things. So to put this into perspective, this is like a 100 meter sprint. This would be more along the lines of a hmm, four to 800, well, 800, no, not so much, but I would say a 400 meter sprint. Okay. For, for um, you know, amateur and up. I mean, we're talking about four times the distance because you're going to need four times the amount of fuel and, and, and if you kind of think about it from that perspective. All right, so 
you're 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 now into this point where we've basically talked about anaerobic. Well, this right here, ATPPC, anaerobic glycolysis. They say this word anaerobic. Anaerobic, and what you should have under you know you will understand later on is that anaerobic meaning without oxygen. So you do not need oxygen to for an energy source. Let's just we you still need oxygen to breathe, and you still need oxygen to function for other things, but you don't need oxygen to help you to process ATP and use it for energy. Okay, so let's these two systems right here are anaerobic, and then the oxidative is aerobic. So it requires oxygen that can help generate ATP from the foods that you eat. So this is more long duration things. And typically, when we talk about this, it's, this is usually anything that's one minute or longer. Okay, and that's really where it comes about. Is now we're talking about things that are more long duration. All right, if you're going for a 1600 meter run, that's one mile. It's gonna, you know, it, it's gonna take you, depending upon your level, anywhere from four to, if you're getting it, you know, upwards of 10 to you know 12 minutes, depending upon how fast you are as a runner. Okay, but you understand here that you're going to be in the oxidative system. But very quickly, just to kind of sum this all up, understand that you are never 100% in one system. Okay, you are never 100% in one system. Now, there are times where you can be 90 plus into one system, like if you're Usain Bolt and you're running a 100 meter for a world record in the Olympics. Well, yeah, your ATP PC system for well, particularly him is going to be turned on and max effort, but it's not 100% because other body systems need to work. It just means that those systems are going to take a back seat to the ATP PC system because they know from his training that once he's done with that all out effort, he's going to be able to recover quickly. And that's where you understand that you're not always in one system. Marathon runners, they're on the other end of the spectrum. They're more in the oxidative system. They're more in the 90 plus region of, of the you know, oxidative system. And that means that the ATP, ATP PC system and the anaerobic glyco, glycolytic or anaerobic glycolysis system, they're both there ready and waiting because what's going to happen is the oxidative system is really good at preserving the use of glycogen stored or glucose in the system. So it's waiting, it's waiting, it's waiting. And then all of a sudden you see those people at the very end of these runs, they get that kick. And that's that very end of that run. What they do is they tap into these short-term energy systems, these two here and here, both of these, and they tap into those so they can get that last burst of energy because it's in that reserve. So again, never always in one system. You need to make that abundantly clear, okay? So looking at the oxidative system one more time, uh, what's going to happen here is they talk about there's that aerobic glycolysis. You're going to creep through that level, okay, and that's going to create some ATP. The Krebs cycle is a way that carbohydrates are broken down. And if we were to go and kind of – let's see if I can find a quick little image for you here if we go to the Krebs cycle because it might be a little bit easier to kind of – they, they don't put a, a, a diagram in here, but if you look, ultimately, this is actually a very good one right here. If you look here, you're going to see there's, you know, gly the, with glycolysis, you're trying to, this is glycolysis, and this is exactly what we're talking about. If my mouse, there we go. This is, you know, a way that we're going to use oxygen to be able to break down carbohydrates or glucose, particularly for this purpose. So the top part we're going to talk about, there's your, your aerobic glycolysis. And here it is right here. Glucose is broken down into enzymes. So um, with enzymatic reactions, it's broken down into acetyl-CoA. And then it, this whole circle with all these enzymatic reactions, that's your Krebs cycle. We don't need to get into everything there. But basically understand that when glucose is begins its breakdown to get ATP, what will happen is as it breaks down further into acetyl-CoA right here, and then it goes into the Krebs cycle, what we are able to do through a couple of different reactions is ultimately be able to, and then on top of that with the electron transport chain, which is another form of um, ATP production, you can produce about 
for every glucose molecule that you have in your system, about 32 to 36 ATP. And that is with carbohydrates. Okay, so that's roughly, depending upon, you know, textbooks, research, it's anywhere between 32 and really sometimes upwards of 38 ATP. So for every glucose molecule that goes through aerobic glyco glycolysis and then the Krebs cycle and then through um, the release of hydrogen molecules, and that's what we're talking about right here with the electron transport chain, when you break down glucose, hydrogen molecules are released, and those hydrogen molecules can then flow and allow electrons to basically cascade down a chain and they create ATP. So for these two hydrogens that are made for every glucose, you're talking about you know upwards of 38 ATP total and majority of it does come from the electron transport chain. Okay, now on the other hand, if we were to pull up beta oxidation, so if you're, you know, when you look at this on your own, I'll try to find a, an image here that might work for you. Um, hopefully I don't get into any issues here, but um, basically beta oxidation is breaking down fatty acids to be able to be used in a in basically to function correctly and you can use and you can produce way more ATP the problem is that it takes so long for fat to break down so I'm just trying to find a decent little diagram here but I can't seem to find one so we'll we'll just kind of go with the flow here and see if we'll just kind of pick up one here and see but basically if you look here here's a fat molecule and it gets broken down and at, it, through four different steps within it, and it's like a little circle, kind of like the Krebs cycle in the diagram component. And then what happens is, once it's broken down, it, it will eventually get into the Krebs cycle. So basically, if we go back to our, um, you know, into into our, you know, talking about everything here, yeah, fats are broken down through beta oxidation, which is the B right here, and then it goes into the Krebs cycle. And between the three fatty acids, so let's kind of show this a little bit here three fatty acids of triglycerides equals uh, 419 ATP produced. Whereas the one glycerol, which makes up the other part of the fatty acid, it creates 41 ATP for a grand total of 460 ATP produced for one triglyceride if I can spell it. Okay, so that's a really large amount. I mean, I'm, let's not sugarcoat it here. That's that's a lot, okay? That's a really high number, okay? And basically what we're saying here is that for every, and I got this backwards, I apologize greatly. I went a little dyslexic right there. It's 441 and 19, my fault. I apologize. I'm trying to do this off the top of the head and miss just a little backwards. So what we're saying here is that fat in comparison to the 32 to 38 ATP for carbs, you know, we're saying here that, you know, there's a massive difference in the amount of stored energy in a glucose molecule and a fat molecule. But the problem is, again, getting this 460 total ATP is very challenging because you have to go through that additional step of beta oxidation before it can get into the Krebs cycle. Okay, so again, this is something that you're going to want to listen to, look at your book, and then always, you know, um, this is one of those videos where I'm not hacking a lung up because I had bronchitis and some of those other videos, but um, you know, leave a comment and I can try to answer the questions as best I can that you might have because this can get very, very tricky. Okay. So, you know, that's how we break down it for energy. Now, if you look here, you notice that protein is not put in here as well. The issue with protein is that it just doesn't have enough. It doesn't really supply the body with enough ATP. So it's negligible. Whenever we talk about an ex exercise physiology, we never really, like, it's because it's such a last-ditch effort and you don't get a lot from it, we don't really discuss it that much because there's just not enough energy that comes from it. And it's really a kind of a scary thing because it shows you how much protein you need to break down to be able to get to then have stored energy found from it. Okay. So one of the things we have to realize is that when we look at, you know, 
all of these systems is, well, what are we doing? What is it that we're doing? How, you know, what's the intensity? How hard are we going? How long are we going for? Intensity and duration are always going to be a problem because, and, and that's why the inverse relationship comes into play. Inverse meaning basically opposite. The higher the intensity that you have, the shorter the duration that it's going to be. The lower the intensity that you have, the higher the duration it's you're able to do. So that's why if you were to do a all out sprint, you know, a hundred meter sprint, you know, the intensity on that is very high, unless you don't push the envelope. But that's not what you do in a hundred meter run. On the inverse side of that, a you know thirty two hundred meter run, which is two miles, that's going to be a you know an intensity that is suitable for every person who is running it. But because your intensity is down, the duration can be longer because the body can adapt to it. And just like I said, let me see if I can find the slide here. Yep, right here. Just like I said, you're never in one system. And I'll keep saying that again. You're never in one of these systems. When you come down here and look at energy in, in, in terms of intensity and duration, you're never in you're never in one fuel source as well. You're, you're using fats, you're using carbs, and you're using some proteins. Don't think that you don't break proteins down, but it's negligible like we talked about. At certain points in time, you're going to require fats to be kind of broken down for energy to stave off glycogen being released from the muscle or the liver, depending upon where it needs to come from. So a lot of it depends on the intensity and the duration and what you're looking for. All right, now again, typically... We said that carbohydrates are going to be the main fuel source that you're going to work from. But it's, like I said, main, not only. Okay, not the only fuel source. It's the main fuel source. And that's kind of what I want to drive home here. All right. So, again, there's that energy from the stored ATP. And there's that phosphocreatine. ATP PCR is small. But, again, that's almost the jump start that gets you to get moving. And then as you get moving... You know, if your body requires it, what it's going to do is it's going to move into the anaerobic glycolysis or anaerobic glycolytics phase. And then, again, depending upon what you're doing, if the duration is longer than that, you're going to start tapping into the oxidative or aerobic system. And that's where we then get into, again, aerobic glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and then the ETC or the electron transport chain. So that's why these two are so important to know what fuel you're going to use and what system you're going to be working predominantly, again, using that word predominantly, okay? So basically, what do we, you know, in terms of costs, um, you know, if, if I said to you, what is a exercise that you lie supine for? Well, basically, lying supine means on your back, prone is on your stomach. When you're lying supine, you're going to burn way less calories because the body doesn't have to work as hard versus standing. Or even sitting. Lying is less demanding than even sitting. All right. Um, the body does prefer oxidative metabolism. So even when you're doing things like resistance training, the body understands like, oh, wow, I can't start off and you know, I can't get into this oxidative metabolism because I have different demands and it immediately switches. And your body switches before you even know it. Okay. So the body does prefer oxidative. And that's like I said, under resting and low intensity types of movements, we we are going to be more in the fat, uh, the fat calorie usage for energy. Okay. Also, when we're in a well, we this is also called in in exercise physiology they call it EPOC, and this is a way that you can kind of remember it, the acronym is EPOC, excess post exercise so after exercise oxygen consumption. When you are exercising, the body doesn't go from, number one, it doesn't start off and go from zero to, you know, 100, all right? It doesn't do that. The body has to gradually work into it. And then when you're done, the body doesn't go from 100 to zero, which would be a recovery. It just doesn't happen that way. What happens is the body has to consume additional oxygen or additional oxygen requirements, especially during strenuous exercise, it's going to need oxygen to help with recovery so therefore when you go to a place like orange theory and they talk about an afterburn what they're really referring to is excess post exercise oxygen consumption or the metabolic burn that happens because your the body needs more oxygen 
post-exercise. And because it needs more oxygen, that means that more energy is going to be released even though you're in recovery and you're still going to keep use, burning calories or increased metabolism post-exercise. That's what that refers to. All right. And then like it says here, during intermittent work, glycolysis provides energy for work and oxidative systems like the aerobic system provide recovery. So during intermittent work, in intervals, in, you know, high to low, high to low, high to low, that means like playing a, a game of basketball. You're running, you slow down. You're running, you slow down. You sprint, you slow down. Your glycolysis, the breakdown of glucose for energy. And then for recovery, you'll get into that oxidative system because you're really going to be here in that epoch stage, the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Okay? So again, just, you know, these are costs. These are these are costs of energy, calories burned, fuel sources used, carbs, fats, proteins, so that we can function correctly at all times. Okay? Now, one of the things that, you know, as a future professional with this certification, when you pass the exam, because I, I'm praying that you, you're watching this video, you're putting out an effort to get better at this. When you're in a you know future profession and you get to work with um, a metabolic cart, meaning the gas exchange, the mass that goes over your face, um, it's it's one of those things where it can detect what fuel source you are mainly in. Are you in a carb mainly? Are you in a fat mainly? Um, are you a mixed, you know, mix? So that's kind of cool, meaning like you're kind of like, you know, part, you know, you're predominantly fat, predominantly carbohydrate because that it can show where the predominance is. What the RQ is, RQ, respiratory quotient, and it's going to be a number that's either 1.0. Okay, let, I'll go back and rephrase that. It's a number that is typically 1.0 or lower, but you can have RQs that go above 1.0. Let's not sugarcoat that here, you know, and say that it's wrong. Okay, but predominantly we're looking for around 1 and then lower because around 0.7, that means fat. So let's talk about why. What we're saying here is that it's the amount of carbon dioxide, CO2, when you are exercising, you know that the waste byproduct of muscle work is carbon dioxide that you breathe out, okay, that gets out, expelled out. That amount of carbon dioxide that is detected through that gas mask and, and through the system, that the computer system that it has to go through, you take that amount of carbon dioxide, you divide it by the amount of oxygen that is consumed, and it's analyzed and spit out, and it understands what's going on. So basically, if we say that, I'm just going to throw some really random numbers out there, but if you had, if you consumed 16 oxygen molecules, it means that if you are at a an RQ of 1.0, that means that you produced and released or expired 16 molecules of carbon dioxide. That gives you a 1.0. Well, why is that? Because it's carbon dioxide divided by oxygen. You you produced. 16 carbon dioxide that were expired and you consume 16 oxygen that's a one to, that's a 16 to 16 or a one to one ratio it's a one that means that in that situation if it's an equal or 1.0 that means that you are a cart you're burning carbs at that time okay now again that's 100 percent of your fuel we talked about it you don't always burn 100 percent, but just for this purpose here this is what we're talking about if you um, have carbon dioxide and you have oxygen that you've consumed and it creates about a 0.7 which means that you have you're expiring a certain amount of carbon dioxide and you're then consuming more oxygen than what you're getting rid of because the bottom number has to be higher for it to be below one 0.7 is about three quarters okay so if you're, you know, you just kind of got to think about it from that perspective. If you've burned X amount of carbon dioxide and X amount of oxygen, if it's about 0.7, it's about three quarters. So for every three carbon dioxide that you expire, you're consuming four oxygen. That means that you're predominantly in the fat fuel source. And if you're in between that, it means that you're a combination of both. 
basically at any given time, like we said, you're not always in that one area, but it's going to dictate where you're closer to. So if you're, you know, this can be really important to understand. And that's why we have to be able to understand that when you have people that are on these testing machines, you know, and, and you're going to be doing this as a professional, well, what's the purpose of it? This is why, because we can see what our cue is. And at that point we know, okay, well, they're really supposed to be in an aerobic burning zone right now, meaning basically um, oxidative using the oxidative system, but their their RQ is closer to a you know fat, at closer to a 0. 0.7. Well, if that's the case, that means that something is metabolically, physiologically wrong within the cells that it's not using the fuel correctly. Or what it could mean too is that depending upon the person's diet, they could be on a low carb diet. And that means that they're going to use fat a lot more than they would carbohydrates. So it really depends on the person that you're working with, but that's really what it's going to spell out for you. And it's very important that you understand that. So this is very important to know. It's like, okay, well, where is this person? If they're supposed to be burning carbs or glucose at this point in time, well, they should be close to one on this readout. Well, if they're closer to a fat, well, then we have some problems and we need to work on getting this person conditioned correctly and then vice versa. If they're supposed to be in a low intensity and they're supposed to be burning fat during that low intensity, but they're predominantly carbohydrate, we can check on the conditioning and try to fix that. So working with athletes, it's the same thing. So you have something to work with, okay? So that's, that's a lot in a short period of time. And like I said, it's one of those things where, you know, questions, ask them, don't be afraid to leave a comment below. It's, you know, it's a lot of information and we can find ways that we can see if we can get you some more detailed answers if you need it. But these are the basics of this chapter that you're going to have to work with. So don't be afraid to, like I said, leave a comment, leave a question, and we'll see what we can do with that. But in basics, you know, we're talking about, you know, our metabolism and how we basically are able to maintain life and be able to move and function like we need to. We broke down how carbs, fats, and proteins, again, use it in that order, carbs, fats, proteins, can help us. Those substrates can be used to supply us with the energy we need so that we can then use ATP correctly in three different pathways. And then we can determine how carbs, fats, and proteins are broken down based on what fuel amount we're talking about so that's really the combination of everything so again it was great to be able to explain a lot of this stuff like i said it's, it can get very confusing but again use your book use the words that i'm kind of hitting on look at these powerpoint slides and you know try to make it happen as best as possible so thanks for listening and i hope that this can help you guys get through to the next session next set help you on your test all right have a great night. Have a great day. Hopefully your New Year's working out really well. Take care.